Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for taking the time from um, your schedule to join us today. Um, welcome to this online session to hear about how data and um, evidence uh, brought chamber music to Welsh communities um, and also how it was supported um, through the Statistician for Society initiative. Um, can I please start with um, a few housekeeping um, items? So can I ask everyone who are not one of the speakers to mute uh, their microphones and uh, turn their camera off, please? Um, we would like to record this session, um, especially the presentations, um, so that we can distribute onto the Royal Statistical Society media channel for wider audience. And also by doing that is when the speakers are presenting, we can have their video focused um, in the video. So if you don't wish to be included in this, it's OK, please just let us know. You can put it in the chat um, or drop me an email. I've put um, uh, my email address on the slide on the uh, right bottom bottom right hand side if you can see that um just drop me a line so we can edit uh, the video um also if you would like to ask uh, questions uh, please feel free to use the chat function you can put the questions in the chat box um um, why are the presentations happening? We also have um, a QA session in the end so that you can raise your hand, um, unmute yourself, and you can turn the camera on as well to ask questions. Um, we've got a little uh, time um, slot here as a, a rough guide for the session. And I hope that's okay. Um, my name is Jiao Song, so I um, I be chairing the session today. I I work as a statistician in Public House Wales. I also serve on the scoping committee in the Statistician for Society initiative, and that's the uh, initiative brought us today together. So the initiative links the professional statisticians with the charitable organisations for the organisations to receive um, statistical or analytical support for free. So we're hoping this session would um, help us to better understand initiative and also what um, the initiative can support voluntary organisations to achieve. Um, we have um, four speakers today. Oh, um, if Amaka doesn't uh, speak, but she's in the background with Amira. Um, so we have Amaka Ogbara today, who is our member engagement manager at Royal Statistical Society. Um, we also have uh, Rob Master Domenico, uh, who is our chair of the Statistician for Society today. Um, so Rob will give us an introduction or an overview of the Statistician for Society initiative um, to start with. Then we also have Perrine Clement Evans, who is the CEO and Artistic Director of Ensemble Cymru. Um, it's a charity based in Bangor in Wales. And we also have Peter Lane, who's our uh, volunteer statistician um, working with Perrin in the project um, within Ensemble Cymru. So Peter and uh, Perrin will cover uh, different aspects from the project. Um, for example, the motivation of the project, how it started, how it worked together to generate um, analytical evidence to bring chamber music into Welsh communities. Um, without further ado, um, should I hand over to Rob to start? That would be great. Thank you, Joe. I'll just you. going to share my slides. Okay, you should all be able to see my slides. Yes. Uh, okay. I don't know if you want to make... Oh, that works now. 
Thank you. Yeah, all right. Cool. So my name is Dr. Rob Domenico. I am Chair of Statisticians for Society. Like Zhao, I'm a volunteer at the RSS. Um, I don't work there. We have uh, a couple of people from the RSS who do work as part of this, and I'll explain that in a minute. Um, and the kind of aim of today's talk is to give you a kind of 15, 20 minute overview of what Statisticians for Society is, for those of you who may not be familiar and kind of how it could be beneficial to you. So what is Statisticians for Society? So essentially what it does, is it's a kind of middleman in connecting up small charitable organisations with professional statisticians. So probably taking a step back from that, we as the Royal Statistical Society are kind of member organisation, lots of members who have an interest in data and use data. And that could be data scientists, statisticians, just people of a general interest in it. And so this whole scheme is looking to kind of leverage all that expertise we've got and all those great people, all our great members, and allow them to kind of help others, because that was a kind of key thing our members want to do. So it, it, it's going to provide the charity with the kind of expert help to do a variety of things. So collect data, analyze, present. But ultimately, it's kind of anything that's got a kind of data twist, we can kind of help you with or we can connect you up with a member who's going to do this for you or help you along your journey. And so it essentially was aimed to allow the members a kind of extra member benefit. So this is only open to RSS members. It's not open to anybody who's got, you know, general data science skills or statistics skills who, you know, just likes to look for charity. It has to be a kind of member of the society. Um, and thus far, it's proved to be very successful. So who can request the support? So we're looking at any third sector organisation. So that's a charity, social enterprise, community interest group, anything that kind of falls under that broad kind of category of third sector you have to be based in the uk and you have to have an annual income of less than a million uh, and that's it that's our kind of criteria for you being able to request the support and i'm going to go through how the scheme works in terms of how it would work for you as a charity looking to request support and you know questions on that which might be common we can kind of cover later i'm definitely happy to kind of talk through that now why should you get involved so if most these days everybody has some kind of data even if you're not necessarily using it but what we can help you do is kind of leverage the data you have be it for kind of use within your organization decision making anything that you think would kind of help you or things you may not even know that you can do with it we can kind of aid you along that journey and in kind of partnering up and using statistics for society you're going to grow your network and you may build a long term connection with a statistician, which, you know, luckily we've got uh, two great speakers coming up who are going to kind of talk about how this works in a practical setting. But ultimately, we're making that connection with you and a charity. And we look to kind of get a statistician to work with a charity with whom they're going to have some kind of interest, because those are the ones which kind of cultivate the kind of best results. And we don't just randomly pick statisticians to kind of join the scheme. And I'll talk about that later in more detail. But people apply and they have to kind of give evidence as to why they think they'd be good for certain projects. So we try and match you up um, as best we can. And for you as a charity, you're going to gain a kind of deeper understanding into the areas of statistics and use of data. Um, and so for you to kind of grow and learn of how to use what you've got, it's going to be kind of invaluable. But perhaps the best part of it is this pro bono. So you don't pay anything. Uh, and I've been involved since the start. I myself and Amica kind of were the ones Amica asked me to get involved to help set this up like m quite a few years ago now. And since then, I've done lots of scopes with lots of charities. And you'd be surprised at the end, we do like a call to go through kind of what we're going to do for you. And they always, a lot of them always ask, how much is this going to cost? It doesn't cost you anything. And the kind of level of access that you get in terms of um, statisticians and the kind of how good these people are, you know, you'd be really surprised at kind of on open market prices, what you would be paying for these people to help you. And they're willing to give you their time for free and, you know, do excellent work to help you as a charity evolve and meet the aims that you have. So the way it works is you as a charity have to request to um, 
use the initiative. So you have to kind of come to us and say, we, we want to be involved in statisticians for society. But after that, you kind of get brought along with us. We have a kind of a quite um, developed system and a lot of people involved in the kind of whole running of this. So as Xiao mentioned at the start, Amaka and Amira, two individuals who work at the RSS who are kind of crucial to this kind of initiative running day to day. They take care of all the kind of day to day running and kind of keep us all in order and do an excellent job supporting you as a charity and the volunteers all the way along that journey. So you've always got this kind of out that you can kind of go to and speak to if you've got issues or just somebody you want to contact. And that's provided for by the RSS. And, you know, we're funded by the National Lottery and that kind of helps us have people, excellent people like these two, really doing great work to kind of make this work. But alongside them, we have a lot of kind of volunteers who play equally key, crucial roles in the whole initiative. And so, as Zhao mentioned, we have a scoping committee of which she sits on. And the idea of a scoping committee is that we look to talk to the charities when they request support to try and flesh out any kind of ideas that they might have or the work they want. Because a lot of the time it, it will need a kind of a statistician, data scientist to kind of twist maybe an idea or a concept into something that we can give back to the members and say, this is the work that needs doing. So that would typically be a phone call with a volunteer uh, charity to go through the process, ask some questions, kind of like an interview in terms of we would be asking you questions about what you want to try and gauge what that is, in, in, as you would in any kind of consultancy work. And then we also have a review panel. So this is as well a number of volunteer statisticians, uh, members of the society who will review work midway through. So as um, you will be given, obviously, a volunteer who's a member and will be excellent. But what we do is we kind of just give it a second look just to kind of say, you know, to, to give you some confidence that we've checked this as well from a second perspective. Because a lot of the time the work everyone does is brilliant, but there might be a different idea or a different way of presenting it that they'll kind of offer. So they will do this review before it comes to you, before you have that final piece of work. And just to ensure that it kind of meets up with what we want and, and more appropriately, is written for a non-technical audience because a lot of the time you as a charity or maybe the kind of output of where this is going to go will be for non-technical people so they can kind of help you with that who will deliver your project so as i've said before it can be any um volunteer statistician any member of the society who's signed up to this scheme and currently we have i think over 700 of our 8,000 members have signed up to this scheme so we have a large pool of volunteers and it kind of it's growing all the time as kind of word of what this is and, and kind of what this can be um, increases. And that's not just UK statisticians, that's international because whilst we're kind of we're based in the UK, we're an international organisation. So there's a lot of good people who kind of are members of this of our society who are looking to give up their time to help you. Um, and so what are the benefits of working with statisticians for society? So in many ways, I think if if hearing this talk or listening to what you're going to see earlier just cultivates the fact of this could be something for you, then get in contact because this is going to be really beneficial. If you've just if you've got an idea you want to you know implement, we can help you in lots of different ways. So specifically, we put in you know better systems and processes for your data. So as a whole, you know you as a charity may not be equipped to you know deal with data in a way that a kind of trained statistician data scientist, a data professional does. And so what we can do is kind of set you up with um, expertise and you know good practice to help you better do what you do already. Because there's obviously only so many hours in the day, we want to kind of help you to help yourselves. And what we can also do is look to gain insight and better understanding of the data you've got. So that could be your personal data that you're collecting on your activities or publicly available data or anything in between you know that's going to help you but we can kind of give you a, a report or some kind of mechanism to show something from your data that you know hopefully is going to be beneficial to you and that should allow you to kind of demonstrate impact and effectiveness so you know common a common kind of uh, thing we get from charities is they're looking for evidence for funding to kind of prove how effective they are or look at the impact they've got and then trying to assess maybe how they can better deliver what they what they want to within the charity um, and so 
the motivation is it's generally, you know, reporting to funders and trustees. People just want a better evidence base. So they just they just want to understand more about what they've got. And a lot of charities' ideas can be quite anecdotal and they can kind of see what's there, but to have you know, a proper kind of robust data-driven approach to kind of back up thoughts or give them new ideas, find insight they already didn't know. That's kind of crucial. So we've seen this, we've worked with a large number of charities now. So this is quite a kind of refined process. And so what what we've got here is kind of something that can be really beneficial to your charity. So here are some organisations that we've worked with. Um, I think at the moment we're well into the 50s, probably a lot higher than that um of kind of completed project we have a lot of kind of projects either underway or completed and we get more all the time so you know but we have the capacity to deal with a lot of projects so if you're interested don't let that stop you just def definitely do apply because we can handle a lot of work as the end as our kind of user base grows and we've got more volunteers and you know we can scale up with you and here's a bit of, um, here's some insight from a charity and a volunteer. I'm not going to read this out. So probably I'll let this sit on the slide for a minute or so. Um, this was a, a great project that was done by our, one of our volunteers, Kim Berea. And we actually, she showed this off in front of some of our other volunteers last week because we had a volunteer meetup. And essentially she built a lot of kind of Excel dashboards for a charity who are looking to kind of, be more robust in how they were using the data and it looked it was really professional really really good stuff she did um and she really liked it and was talking about how she did this and she has, actually wasn't based in the uk she was based in gibraltar and did this and you know from reading what they've put there both of their kind of insights on this you can see you know they both found benefit in this and this isn't just a kind of one-way statistician just helps charity these are kind of mutually beneficial relationships the statistician will get a lot out of this or the RSS member as well as the charity. And, and you know, that kind of thing's great because both both kind of people are getting things out of this project and they're kind of improving and enjoying it. Um, and so we can kind of, if people have questions on this or anything about it, we can uh, go through that later. But how do you request support? So um, what you're going to hear next is it's a kind of really nice case study about a great bit of work as well. This work is brilliant. Um, but if any of this kind of appeals to you, all you have to do is just drop us um, a message. Even if you're not sure what you want to do, um, just mail the team and we can speak to you about it. Or if you want more information, go to the website. It's got information on the initiative. But hopefully what you're going to see today through these talks can kind of you know, spark that flame, which maybe makes you want to reach out. And in reaching out, you're not committing to anything. Um, you are in as a charity are always in control of this approach you know throughout this the way this works we have various different stages where you we make sure that you're comfortable you're not going to force you into anything you don't want to do so it takes nothing to just reach out and ask a question and you've also got the questions at the end so if any charities have specific questions relating to them and how this would fit into the initiative I'd be welcome to uh, take those questions so don't hold back um, but that is the end of my slideshow. So I'm going to turn my camera off and hand back to Jao. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Um, well, I can't see it. Oh, I can see it now. Um, thank you, Rob. Um, I think the next one on the um, stage is Perrine. Um I wondered, so sorry, we were we discussed that about having um, a little intro session if we don't have many attendees, um, and I forgot. Um, I'm sorry. So, um, um, is it okay if I ask the attendees to put a short um, intro? or bio into the chat function, if that's okay. Or you can do that uh, where if you have questions in the end in the Q&A. Thank you. Um, Perrin, would you mind to start sharing the slides for the presentation and we can kick off? Hello, everybody. Uh, it's really great to be here. Uh, for those um, uh, from this side of the border and uh, really nice to make contact with others um, elsewhere. Uh, my name is Perrin Clement Evans. I'm the Chief Executive and Artistic Director of Ensemble Cymru. And um, uh, 
This is just uh, what I'm trying to give in this presentation is from a very small charity, um, how this project was a catalyst uh, for our um, use of data generally. Um, and just to show you where we were and uh, where we've arrived and how far we have really yet to go. Um, just want to thank Peter Lane and the Royal Statistical Society for their um, fantastic support and patience, which is very important. So um, this just gives you an idea of the project timeline. Um, I'll leave the detail to Peter, but uh, just gives you an idea. Um, I was listening to Radio 4 and I heard uh, this fantastic opportunity uh, being talked about. Um, I can't remember the programme and I contacted uh, the office and they were really fantastic, very friendly, very approachable. And we quickly, um, well, I didn't hear anything for a bit. Um, and then um, I got the fantastic news that they'd found somebody who loved music and would be absolutely thrilled to uh, work with us. So um, Peter then um, worked with us uh, just building up the project, which is really important to get the scope of the project right uh, and to really understand um, because we'd never worked with a statistician before, and we'd never worked with anyone who was data focused. And so it's what was really important for this, the success of this project was to really understand each other and get to know each other and um, get that element of trust where you're able to ask questions and not feel a total idiot about asking them, um, and, and then start to understand how a statistician um, looks at the sort of data that you're dealing with as a charity day to day. And uh, it, it was quite lengthy, but I, I do stress that the importance is really to take the time to really get the scope down because it's really natural for us as a charity thing to come in very broad. Um, we're looking, especially if you're a small charity, you're looking for anything that can sort of hit and solve many, many problems. Um, and I think it's just having that patience to sit back and just to take a very, very small step and understand that it's that first step that will um, it will be iterative and you'll take small, small steps, but each step will be taking you along a journey. So it's definitely not something where um, you have a problem, you fix it and there you are. It's definitely something which is iterative and you grow as an organisation. So we're still in touch with Peter, um, not as much as I should be. Um, I call him now um, just out of the blue and annoy him with questions every now and again. Um, but we've promised to catch up in October. Um, but just to show that the, um, the relationship goes on past the project. So who are we? Just to give you an idea of the scale. So we're as small as a charity can get, um, or we're certainly on the smaller side. Uh, we're a registered charity and company limited by guarantee. Uh, we've got an annual turnover of 100,000 and we were founded in 2001. We have 10 trustees, uh, one part-time member of staff, uh, myself, and we have a team of suppliers from marketing, fundraising and um, graphic design and the whole um, uh, are fantastic uh, musicians, composers and um, music practitioners that we call upon them uh, to help us make an impact for our local communities across North and Mid Wales. And uh, importantly, our key uh, relationships are with Bangor University, who very generously give us an office, and uh, Venue Cymru, which is the major uh, receiving venue. Uh, so with all the big shows will go to this venue um, that are visiting North Wales. And we tour with our lovely partners and friends, Midwell's Opera, every year um, under the stage. So you don't get to see us there, but um, uh, you do get a great experience if you happen to be in Wales in February or March. Um, what do we do? Uh, well, we promote understanding of our shared humanity and enhance the well-being of communities across Wales by presenting opportunities for people to connect, collaborate and share their stories through music and the creativity of musicians. So this is very much about the ecology of music making and our um, our aim is to 
um, make sure that there's a really vibrant music ecology in North Wales, which is inclusive and accessible to all. And that this is an agenda that uh, I think every charity is very aware of, of how important it is that we are, uh, certainly in the arts, um, are really focused on um, uh, making sure that we're reaching uh, all the members of our communities and we are representative of those communities. And so you already are starting to see where data is starting to come in. So when I say representative of our communities, well, what does that mean? Um, what are the statistics? How can we make sure that the people in decision making roles are actually uh, our trustees, myself and other senior um, uh, creatives are actually representative and understand um, the communities that we serve. And so um, part of my work with Peter, which I went off on, was um, just to discover the amazing amount of free data, data that is freely available to us, um, which I hadn't known uh, until Peter asked the Arts Council and suddenly this flow of data, which was a bit overwhelming, but um, did help us to understand a lot more about the context within which um, the charity was working. So um, I, I hope, and I think this is recognisable to any small charity. Um, so w as a charity, your main, one of your main functions is to bring investment um, to address the needs of the communities you serve. And in doing that, you're approaching um, trusts and you're approaching, in our case, if you're an arts organisation, Arts Council is very important, and you're approaching government and evidencing the needs of the communities that you are seeking to serve is really important. And um, you can, uh, I think charities are very good. I think it's been referred to as charities are quite good at case studies and um, giving the narrative um, but I, I, certainly for me, I find it more difficult to get the numbers behind the narrative to, so for people who, for whom numbers mean more than the narrative or, or are important, then it's really important that we're um, giving numbers and narrative that both um, uh, evidence uh, the need. And um, uh, so that that's really important. And it's very difficult for a small charity um, to have the time, the headspace to get hold, to one, get hold of the data and two, um, manipulate that data into something that's simple and helps you with your communications with your prospective donor or your prospective funder or, or, or the Arts Council or, or government. Um, again, the second point, um, the impact. Um, this is very important to charities. How how on earth do you can you communicate the impact of what you do um, to show um, what the impact of the um, donors, the, the money, the donors who are so generous, how can you show to them and communicate to them simply, in simple terms, um, what an amazing impact that their generosity makes? Um, so again, this is another case of, yes, narrative, but also numbers, um, because uh, certainly the high net value uh, donors are um, possibly more likely to be uh, to see numbers as being important to them um, to show whether the charity that they're uh, investing in is actually um, effective at making the most uh, out of their generosity. And then internally, um, th there's uh, something that I think we're still well away from, and, and that is to improve decision making within the organisation. So um, I, d I don't know, but quite often, um, I don't know about other charities in this uh, meeting, but quite often you have a, um, a meeting with trustees where there might be more than one idea and you get to the point where nobody quite knows what to do because there's uh, two different ideas both that could be true, but how do you then move in, uh, through an objective way, which doesn't make it personal about this is my idea and it's much better, to get it in using data and using um, and, and trialing things, trialing ideas in very small ways and quickly, and to prove which idea is the, the one that is the most effective. Um, and I think that's another thing that sometimes we miss with gathering data 
um, it, um, that that's really important. Um, and it also helps um, unlock ideas from your board and from other people who are interested in the charity, because you can say, oh, that's a great idea. Let's have a look at that. Let's trial it um, in a very small way and we'll get the data from it and we'll see how effective that idea is. And so it um, certainly that's um, been very effective for me in um, helping people help me with, with bringing ideas out and knowing that I'm listening to those ideas and there's not that sort of uncomfortable on pass of how do we go from here with two ideas. Um, I think the project's impact, um, as I say, Peter will talk about the detail. Um, I think the thing that um, the impact was is that the realisation, because we went into this project not knowing what we didn't know. And what um, the project gave us, it started helping us to identify, to know what we didn't know, so that we could actually um, bring the organisation whose culture wasn't about data, it, it wasn't about statistics, because we never felt we had enough time to be thinking about statistics and, and numbers. It enabled us to start a conversation with trustees and funders about this new journey that we were taking. So the project impact has been um, cultural within the organisation. It's enabled us, it was a catalyst for us to start having really um, quite sometimes quite challenging conversations with um, many people for whom statistics is something that's not part of their day to day. And therefore, this idea that we're going from a charity that does great stuff, goes and do, does concerts or, or goes into schools and does impact, that's what our focus should be. And then to suddenly be thinking, well, oh, no, we've got to think about something as exciting as data and statistics. And how's that going to help us um, continue and build on our great work? So I think that's that's the big impact on the organisations that we've now talk about data at trustees meetings and we, we, we've got a way to go, but it's certainly been a catalyst uh, for that process. Um, the other impact of the project is that we initially went about audiences. We thought we went with a question that said, how can we um, get our concert halls full of audience? That, that was it really. And where are we going to target our very limited resources of publicising? And what we found when going through um, with Peter uh, using Mosaic and, and all the other tools that were there, we realised that actually um, it wasn't the question that we needed to be asking. Um, what the answer that came back was, you're not big enough to be trying to um, get audience into the concert hall and um, uh, communicate with your followers and do the good stuff in the community. So what's happened is that we've moved from paid concerts to concerts of fundraising events, of which, of course, our musicians are still playing in very high quality. Um, but we've removed the ticket barrier, which also means it's much more equitable and um, that people, however much they can afford, they will just be able to come in. But for those who are able and in a position to help us, we found that they give a lot more. Um, whereas a ticket price of £10 or £5 can quite often, everybody feels, oh, I've paid my £5 and that's it and that's the transaction. The other thing that's happened with the um, the answer that came from this project, which is not what we expected, um, was of course we saw data as valuable. It's an asset. It's something that needs to be looked after. So in a, any trustees meeting, you see a balance sheet and you see a profit uh, pro surplus and deficit. But very rarely do you have a balance sheet of your data or what have you got that's there and is quite often missed as something very valuable um, to be looking after and to be how well are we using this asset that we have as a charity. And we, because of this project, um, the impact has been that we've moved to a, a CRM system um, that's much better uh, aligned for the charity and that's helping us communicate with our followers. Um, so both the fundraising concerts and the CRM system now is helping us to build a relationship with our followers through having data that we understand them better and we can um, have a more meaningful 
conversation with them because we know them better. And then uh, the third point is about, um, I think I've spoken to quite a few tr charities um, wondering whether we were insane for taking this uh, these steps in working with data. And every, most of the feedback I got was, you're too small and uh, you've been very sophisticated in your ambitions for using your data. And, and I started to look into this a, a bit more and I realised that one of the things that is missing um, quite often in charities at trustee level is a responsibility for information governance. So that governance of the data, and certainly with GDPR, um, this is something that's much, much more important um, than it ever was and, and growing important. Um, but quite often I've seen charities that are always saying, you know, are you doing anything with this? Um, do you have a trustee that's responsible for this? So again, this is something else that's come out and for the first time in, I think it's just very recent, November, we appointed a, an IT manager from uh, Bang University to be our first trustee and she has responsibility for information governance. And it's certainly a journey, um, but at least at trustee level, we now have somebody who's speaking knowledgeably about um, how we collect data, how we use data, and we set up our first data working group. So organisationally, this project being, a, it wasn't what we anticipated, but this project was a catalyst for this organisation to go from um, nobody in trustees or board meetings talking about data to we're talking about data, still got a way to go, still can keep improving, but certainly we've come further along on our journey. Um, this may be a bit overwhelming. Um, I went on a sabbatical in uh, New Zealand and Australia, um, uh, self-funded. Um, I've been working at this 20 years and I felt I needed to refresh. And I worked with two for two months with two major chamber music organisations, the Chamber Music New Zealand and also Music Aviva in Australia. And both of them have a national role. Um, the New Zealand organisation has a million turnover and the Australian organisation has a £7 million pound turnover. And during that time, um, I, uh, because I was on this journey um, already with Peter, I was sort of poking at, well, how do they use data? And I did some research online and I, um, and I came across this, which I think is something that's probably recognisable to people in this field. Um, um, uh, the ambition of becoming a data-centric organisation. And there are some nice principles in this, which I'm very happy and you, you'll be able to see in the presentation uh, to share. It's probably overwhelming for an organisation that's never used, with donate, uh, used data, but it's probably quite a good um, eight principles um, which can be adapted and may be um, made to be relevant to that organisation. And I think if... Um, there's one thing I've realised from this journey we've had is that maybe if we'd known about this and, and um, possibly had the organisation committing initially to some principles about data before getting um, on with this project, maybe that would have made things um, quicker, easier, I don't know. But in any event, we got to the, the right um, uh, end result. Um, I'm giving you this because um, during my visit to Australia and New Zealand, um, I uh, spoke to the chief executive of the Melbourne Recital Centre, which is a very new charity. Um, and one of the things that um, I still haven't succeeded, but I'm going towards is this use of infographics to um, very simply give um, uh, in a few seconds a snapshot of a charity and the impact you're making. Um, and this struck me as something that if I could aim towards something like this um, in our annual report, our trustees report, um, I think we would have gone a long way in helping the readers of our uh, trustees report um, to understand more quickly uh, the impact we're making in for, for North and um, West Wales uh, communities. Um, just want to thank again Peter for his kindness, <laughs> limitless patience, generosity and hard work and thanks also to the Royal Statistical Society for getting us together and helping us start our journey and thank you all for listening and um, hopefully something in my rambling has uh, been helpful. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Perrine. I think that's a really nice summary and um, an explanation of the journey, um, which I read um, before the event, I read through Peter's notes and I, I do understand that's only a small part of the project that you guys are trying to work to. So it is the first opportunity I had to actually have an overview of what the project is about and then the journey you've gone through. So thank you very much. Um, can I pass uh, to Peter um, for the presentation? Um, oh, cool. Let me see you. Can we check the sound OK, Peter? OK, you ready? Yes. OK, right. let's go. Hello. Thank you. Hi. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Peter Lane, and um, I'm going. I'm not going to talk about all the project. There is a script, which is available from our organizer, and indeed, I wrote an article for Chance, which is the U.S. version of Insight. And if anybody gets fascinated and would like a copy of that, I can provide that to them as well. My own journey into becoming a statistician uh, is one that quite a few people have followed. I was originally a chemist and I ended up in a management science department uh, of Unilever and I was doing lots of clinical trials and decided I ought to find out a bit more about what I was doing. And so I started doing the Institute of Statisticians exams. A lot of people have followed this route and it's not a bad way of becoming a statistician because you're not so mathematically inclined. Other people who have followed this route are Klaus Moser, who uh, was an extreme example of this in that he went and looked at, he became a lecturer in statistics and used to have to go and look at what he's going to teach people and then go and teach them. And another very distinguished uh, person who followed this route, a chap called Ian Evert, who sat next to me in school when we were 12 in Neath Grammar School. And he, you can, you can look him up on your site and he's very distinguished, did a lot of work on DNA. Um, I, I eventually ended up as a market researcher for initially for Unilever and then for what became Grand Met. And um, I became fairly prominent in the market research society. I'll come back to that in a minute because it leads into something else. But first of all, how did I get involved in this project? Well, um, I, I was attracted to the advert which said, we're looking for a statistician. And um, it was two things that were quite strong. One, it was in Wales, and therefore uh, that, had a, that had an attraction. And secondly, it was music. Uh, and whilst not being a musician, I've always been very fond of all types of music, latterly Wagner, but it all starts somewhere and chamber music is very important. So I met um, Perrin at his uh, one of his away days and uh, found him a very fascinating person. And he's also a very fabulous clarinetist. You hear him playing the solo at the start of Act 3 of Tosca. It's absolutely wonderful. He could be a, 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 a solo a concert clarinetist almost anywhere, I think. Uh, but he's a, he's a total uh, polymath. And so he's interested in very great many things in life. So he's a very stimulating person to work with. Back to talking about market research. As I was quite involved in market research, um, I was invited to chair a presentation by someone called Richard Weber. It was called A Classification of Residential Neighbourhoods. And it was based on the, the 1981 census was the first time any demographic type information was included. And you were able to do the analysis by enumeration districts, which is 100 households. Now, for marketeers, this is when they realized what they were getting. This is a great breakthrough because it meant you had social, you had some demographic analysis by quite small units. And this is why this has really led, in the end, to the great growth of things like the supermarkets 
and especially Tesco and Sainsbury's, things like that. And it's also developed into two great big firms. So BMRB have developed Acorn and Experian has developed a system called Mosaic. And I'm going to be dealing with how we use those things in this project. My, after I worked for, for a great deal of time for large organizations, I ended up in consultancy with small market research firms and small business, business firms. And I mainly work with small companies. And the thing you realize with small companies, you don't have any money. And so you're always looking for any information that's going to be helpful to you. And um, so you spend a lot of time in the 80s and 90s scrabbling around in libraries everywhere. But now, of course, that information is much more available to you through the internet. And the, the, the Business Statistics Office or the OPCS, or whatever we like to call it now, puts, puts nearly everything online and a tremendous amount of information is available to you all just by sitting at your computer, which makes analysis a lot more simple. Now, looking around, we, we, looking at the information available, the Arts Council in Wales produces a survey every four years that tells people that shows you what sort of activities people are taking place in in sort of uh, sort of culturally and what you get from that is that concerts and the operas and things like that are attended by about 20 percent of people so it is a minority sport so this isn't a disaster but it does mean you have to be a little more sort of adventurous and a little more entrepreneurial and a little more experimental in how you collect your information. This is where we go back to classification of residential neighbourhoods because the Arts, Arts Council in England have, have a, a branch called the Arts Agency, which is a very clever market research and marketing organisation. And they have done a great deal of analysis based on the uh, ticket information, which ticketing information nearly always contains basic postcode, and it's the postcode information which relates you back to Mosaic and to Acorn and enables classification to take place. And the, uh, the, the arts, arts agency has developed a thing called, called the audience spectrum, and in this they find one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten different types of what they call cultural groups. Where they have very sort of descriptive names, like like for you, you can work out what they are from what the names are. Metro culturals, commuter land culture buffs, experience seekers, dormitory dependables, trips and treats, home and heritage, up our street and frontline families kaleidoscope creativity and supported communities. And the big, big strong ones for them are metroculturals, commuter land counter buffs, culture buffs and experience seekers. But you don't get many of those in Bangor and North Wales. You get things like dormitory dependables and home and heritage. Home and heritage are rural and small town pensioners attracted to daytime activities and historical content. Now you may ask yourselves, what on earth has this got to do with Wales? Because that was the that was the English Arts Council information. But what the work the Arts Council in Wales is trying really, really hard to do catch up, and they have managed to buy they developed drive time analyses for thirty nine of the towns in in Wales, and so and within within these, there's all sorts of in, information about cultural activities. And exclusively, and not exclusively, but particularly the mosaic classifications by three-digit postcode. And so, what we did was look at which of the mosaic uh, classifications were close to the mosaic, the um, Arts Council classifications, and decided which of those mosaic classifications would be useful for us in terms of finding the sort of people who wanted to come to our concerts. So when we did that, we then able to, we've, we've tra tracked through that and found the ones we really wanted to get at. And that's how we then went out and found within the Bangor area, 
the three-digit postcodes, which are likely to give us the sort of people we want. And we use that then to, to put out leaflets so that we could get a return from one of our concerts in Bangor. And the result was reasonably successful. So that was one small aspect of what we did. And if you were, I, I'm keeping this fairly short because you've had quite a long time already. As uh, so if you want to see more about what we did, because we did look at the internal organization, we did look at um, some, some sort of consumer attitude research as well. And we basically, what I was mainly responsible for doing is, is saying to the parent, well, this is something you might be able to do, or this is something you won't be able to do. And so the, in a way, refining his, his ambitions away from wanting to convince everybody who didn't come to concerts, you should come to concerts, but get, encouraging the people who'd like to come to concerts to come to our concerts and help build up the organization in that way. So that was a fairly short piece of work. And um, I think I'll probably stop there and ask if anybody has got any questions. Thank you. How's that? Thank you very much, Peter. That was great. Um, well, when you said it was a very short piece of work, I'm sure it's a big piece of work and um, it's a it's a really useful piece of work to the charity as well. Um, I I think we get to we're, we're right on time. Um, so can I ask um, all our speakers to put their camera on and back to the stage and so that we can start a Q&A session? Hi, Perrin. Hi, Rob. Um, right. So um, I had um, looked through the chat, and they they were there were a few questions about how to get in touch with the um, um, the Statistician for Society initiative. Um, and I wonder, anybody wanted to raise their hands for? Um, any questions you have? Because um, um, Amaka has been really helpful putting all the contact details in the chat. So I'm hoping those questions have been addressed. Um, so if you have um, any questions, uh, feel free to put your hands up and unmute your camera. Or sorry, unmute your microphone and put your camera on. Uh, no, um, I have. Oh, I think I can see hands. Let me move. Bear with me. So I've got Pat first. Good to see you, Pat. Um, hey, Joe. And let's um, get Pat and then Ian in. So would you mind um, just start with um, who you are and um, what, uh, what was um, the motivation of joining the session today? Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm Patrick Tudor. I'm a data scientist. I'm based in Swansea. Um, I've worked in directly with JR before. Um, and one of my colleagues, Tim Davis, I think he worked with you, JR, uh, organized setting some of this up, and he's been talking about it a lot. So I've been thinking about it. I'd, I'd love to join as a volunteer, to be honest. So um, my question was to Robert, um, what's what do I need to do? Cool. So question one to you is, are you a member of the Royal Statistical Society? I, I, yes, I'm pretty sure I am. Yes. Excellent. That's I'm the first part. Um, you literally just have to register. Um, if I... Um, um, Amica can put in the chat because it'll be easier. The link you need to go to and you just sign up to the scheme. And so what you're essentially doing is you're opting in to our... Uh, join our little club and you'll get email alerts as and when projects go live so um kind of like with peter he was part of this he saw the email alert or was on the website saw this project and applied the same type of thing will happen if a project comes up that you like the look of you just have to apply and the application is generally a cv uh, and a covering letter and, and the cv is important don't get me wrong but the covering letter is important just to demonstrate why you're applying to this because obviously Peter explained it really well in his case. He's, he's very interested in, in kind of what they're doing. It's, you know, it's in Wales. A lot of this appeals to him. Um, so it was a good match. And so what we try and do is when we've got a charity 
and a volunteer we try and find a good match based on what you your kind of ex, what you want what you what you're interested in and kind of what the charity needs because if you can kind of if you're both on the same wavelength that project will go much better but ultimately we'll we'll be looking to match the best volunteer for that uh charity and there will in many cases there are many volunteers who apply and so sometimes you might not get one on, on one go but you know you you can always try again it's not like a one and done so we have people who will you know if they're not successful they'll be successful on the second project that comes up or sometimes if you had a colleague you wanted to work with you could apply as a, like a group do it as two of you for example we had a talk the other day on two volunteers who saw a project they both liked and decided let's do it together split the load and so there's lots we can do and for like younger statisticians if we think we can kind of match you up with somebody a bit more experienced and kind of get the best for both of you we'll kind of approach you to see if that would work so there's lots of ways you can get involved but ultimately Amica will put the link in the chat you can sign up on the scheme and you'll start getting emails and uh she's going to share the details on how to register via there so it's just in the chat for you and as for anybody if you want to get more details drop uh, drop them a message on that email address yeah thanks well that sounds like a nice process i'll get signed up for that great good stuff thanks pat thanks rob um can we bring ian in hi ian hi um thank you for the presentations um all really interesting um so I'm uh, based up in Scotland and a um, couple of ways I'm interested today, but specifically thinking as um, someone who's a, a conductor and at the start of trying to get, get a professional choir running. Um, so really interested in the parallels here. Um, obviously, this is a much more established group um, that you've got. Um, I'm apologies, I don't want to butcher the Welsh. Um, but um, a couple of specific questions for either. Is it um, Perrin? Sorry. I'm pronouncing that wrong, and uh, Peter. Um, I think the last thing Peter was talking about was um, the types of audience. So I'd be interested in hearing a little bit more because there's that question of, in the classical music world, are you trying to kind of, with expanding your audience, are you trying to get people with similar demographics to the existing audience? Are you trying to reach kind of um, demographics that you don't normally reach? So I'd be interested in just hearing a little more about how you approach that question and what the data was telling you on what you could do there. Um, and then also uh, funding was mentioned. Um, I think maybe uh, Robert was mentioning it as one of the things that charities are often looking for. So just interested here in this particular example, have you used any of the research at all when talking to funders and um, what was kind of their take on it um, or how did you approach using it to, to um, speak to them? Thank you. Who wants to go first? <laughs> uh, I, I can have a go. Um, uh, there's a lot in there to unpack here, and, and I'd be very happy to do a follow up call with you and, and maybe unpack a bit more if, if that's um, helpful to you. Um, I, I think the thing is, um, because you, like us, uh, appear quite a small organisation uh, driven by passion, uh, which is not uncommon <laughs> for small charities. Um, it is to be really specific and not be afraid of making the wrong decision about where you want to start with the data. Because if you can be really specific and narrow in the scope, so for you, it might be where am I going to get, where's the best place to get members for my choir who are of the profile that I'm looking for? That might be a start question. Uh, you talk about funding. It's no, it's it's not really something where you well I've had experience where a funders turned around to me and said ah oh, that's brilliant I really enjoyed your numbers um, what it does to us it, it helps us be more effective at communication so quite often you see quite um, anecdotal evidence about the impact you're making and as artists we feel so passionate about what we do that we we don't want to hear what sometimes what actually the people we're trying to reach are saying. So it's actually helpful not only to the funder, but to us to inform our work, to be quite systematic about asking and uh, using. So we did use SurveyMonkey to survey 
how well we were doing. So your choir, I don't know what it is, but if it was an inward facing organization where you're trying to bring benefits through singing, and that's the focus of your charity, then you'd obviously want to be really um, getting a message out there of how those benefits uh, with well-being or, or whatever it is, and, and in numbers, you know, 90% of people that turned up to uh, first rehearsal with Ian uh, were so suddenly everything was cured and off it, I mean, I'm being flippant, but you, you know what I mean? So, or if it's an outward looking organization where it's the impact of your choir in the community, then again, it's about being really clear what is the one question. I think that's what we, well, I find the most difficult because I have so many questions because uh, I, I, any art, most musicians are very curious people. You have so many questions, you want answered, and you have Peter coming along saying, well, I can help you answer, and you go, and, and that's to try and ride it back and really be clear and small and know that you're gonna learn a lot from that first iteration, which will help inform the choice of your next question. So you're learning how which questions to ask as much as you're learning from the answers you're getting, if that makes sense. And so funders, we'll start seeing an organization on the website who are really clear and really focused on where they as uh, where their strengths are and where they're benefiting their community whoever that community is you want me to say something um we i being a small organization um you what you want to do is to follow the, the furrow that the tank has set up in the first place so rather than try to bust the walls down yourself. You want to follow where the breakthroughs are. So what other people have found to be the optimal types of demographics for uh, concert goers, we sort, of, we sort of use what they had found out. And it so happens that we have small area data in Wales that we could relate to what the people in England had found out. Now, I don't know what you have up in Scotland, uh, maybe you're, you're, so let's let's have a look, see what you've got. But there, there is an arts council in Scotland, yeah. and they're probably quite active in providing information. Peter, I, I did just to come in there. There is a, a wonderful data officer in Arts Council Scotland. I've met him. He's absolutely oh, fantastic. Well, well, so so I, I mean, a good, a good start. These guys are very very helpful, and a good start would be for you to contact the arts council. And the data officer, research officer in, in in Scotland, give you a start. Find out the sort of people who go to the, how they find the sort of people who go to concerts and to take part in music making. Is that helpful? Yeah, thank you very much, both. That's really really helpful. Yes, if you would like to read um, the article I wrote, then do do contact the. Contact the organizer and I'll, I'll shift, I'll send you a copy because it might help you to get going. Yeah, that'd be super. Thank you. So just me, if you just forget your contact details and I'll send something on to you. Ian, out of curiosity, have you actually set this up yet or is this a kind of idea to do it? Uh, at like, um, done funding applications and not yet kind of operational. So like at that, kind of tipping point between almost getting going and so it's that that kind of early stage of um yeah helping to focus yeah i mean uh to do and kind of who your audience are and um yeah what where you can best identify like i think like um Perm was saying like you know there's there's so much you're passionate about you know what are the things that you really can focus on that will make a kind of tangible impact in in the community um yeah yeah i mean you, you can reach out to us for us and see if we can help you out once you're up and running because you're clear yeah, you yeah. most likely qualify for it so i, I would say drop, i'll drop you an email yeah, that as well it's it's never too early and especially and it's just just the general thing to most charities you could probably never get that data specialist statistician whatever they want to call themselves data practitioner in early enough if you're going to do something because they can st help you from maybe you know, shape the way you want to go. So you don't have to have that kind of big idea. And for like any of you on the call thinking about using the initiative, if you've got like, a, if you've got this like kind of, we think we have data or there is data out there, how do we use it? 
that's broad enough a question for us to come and help you. You don't have to come to us with this fully like kind of fleshed out idea of what you think you need us to do. We don't need to necessarily know that. All we need to understand as statisticians is what your aims are and what you, you want to do and we'll help you do that. And I think that's one of the things that probably not all charities maybe understand. You don't need to come in with all the answers that, you know, all your questions perfectly formed and we can just solve them. You can come in with something really broad and we'll just kind of flesh it out together. And that that works really well in general because we can kind of help you like from the scoping committee. You might be the pleasure of speaking with someone like Zhao who can uh, essentially help you kind of flesh out what you want into a pro like a project that can really kind of benefit what your charity needs in exactly the way Peter's done in the examples he's shown. So even if you're not entirely sure on what you want to do, it's never too early to reach out to us. And, and, and that, that's for you, Ian, but just in general for anyone on this call who's thinking this could be interesting, just like let's start the chat. If it doesn't go anywhere, it doesn't, but you'd be surprised more times than not, it will go somewhere. Thanks, Rob. I think you just um, answered one of the questions I got for the for the charities who don't really think they've got a defined question. I think the uh, I I would like to come in here as well for um, as someone um, work on the scoping committee. There, it you don't need to come in with a defined question at all. Um, I sometimes get, so the, the inquiry form, if you had the chance to have a look, so the inquiry form is uh, broader enough for you to put thoughts together. And what we, as a member of the scoping committee, will do is to read the scoping form and try to think of um, a few things that we can suggest and then do some homework before we can meet. So there'd be a scoping core normally between the member of the scoping committee and the charity representatives. And what I normally do is to kind of ask loads, loads, loads questions and then trying to understand what the charities really wanted. So I can propose different questions they would like to answer. And then most of the time among the list of the questions, the charity representative will say, oh yeah, that's the one we would like to know. So I think that's where the first step is. So it is um, a team game. So we help you to figure out the questions and then you have the opportunity to um, decide which one is the most beneficial to you or the project. So that's, um, yeah, that's what we do in the scoping panel in this uh, initiative. And yeah, just to add to what Jao said, it's, you can be very vague on your application in terms of what you want. We're really just looking to see if you meet the criteria before to allow us to kind of give you access to all of this. We'll help you formulate that question exactly the same way she said. So even if you don't know what to put on the form, just a bit about what your charity is doing, the data you think is out there, that you, that, you know, that you can see some benefit in it, but you want some help. That's broad enough for us to get started. So even as far as filling in that form, don't worry about kind of what you put on it in terms of what your aim is. Just make sure, you know, put your details on and we'll just make sure you tick the boxes so that we can actually start the process. Thank you, Rob. Um... I, let me just double check. I can't see hands at the moment, but can I take the opportunity to ask um, uh, one or two questions here? Um, sure. So, um, so I think uh, I so want to uh, parade. I was cu curious about how long it actually take um, for the implementation. Um, to happen, so the implementation from um, the analysis that Peter's down. Well, we well, just put in and say if we hadn't had if we hadn't had COVID, we would have done things a lot faster. <laughs> sort of, I, I think COVID did get in the way. everything yeah. dead. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so um, I think that's a very difficult question, uh, Chad, because actually the implementation that is that we learned something we didn't expect to learn um, and therefore the implementation is bringing data to the center of the organization 
uh, and therefore and that's ongoing that's a journey it's not a one-off so um i i think it was learning so if if anything the implementation was um because i'd learned a lot from peter i'd, I'd learned um how a statistician approaches data and i was i learned how maybe we could apply um the statistics to our different areas of operation fundraising communications um decision making so um i so i'm not sure i can answer the question other than that we did trial oh i suppose i can answer it um i think what we did uh pete you remember we um tried to target our leafleting um yes, by sure. going from the data so yes. actually um i think the thing was we were highly iterative about it so we did well, let's try this and we'll go to i think it was 50 households in clandidna that were on our highly high target list and we were doing a concert nearby and um, that was manageable and it was enough and then we tried to measure how um whether the people that turned up were actually had been contacted whether so so actually the answer is iteratively <laughs> and quickly and fast it's because you don't want a big elephant that you sort of then you never do so just do little bits of analysis get insight from the statistician then put it into action in a manageable way and then learn from it and then circle around again and um, oh that's really good to see yeah. and i suppose it's the more we know the more we don't know so it's actually a process uh, exactly as you said um do you think if there is anything um, you would have done differently? No. <laughs> <laughs> I, if I say no, that sounds like... No, that. It can be a no. <laughs> I, I you can it try is. something out. If it doesn't work, you stop doing it, you know. I, yeah, I think both Peter and I were quite... I, I, I don't think so. Not because I think we did it the right way. It's because... I don't really know what other way we could have done it. Exactly. <laughs> That's it. I think you have to try things out. Don't be scared is the answer. And obviously in these organisations, we don't have a lot of money, so we're not going to waste anything. Yeah. But Peter, gonna... P Peter was quite scary sometimes, but, you know, I got it. <laughs> <laughs> or his numbers were. <laughs> Guys, uh, just to follow on from that, it's like a really good point. Like you, you obviously did this through COVID. I think for like others who are looking to do these projects, there isn't like a kind of template on how long these things take. They usually That's take right. as long as they need to. And I mean, at the start, what were your expectations on timeline? It, did you have a couple? So I don't know. I can't remember the dates. I remember the project. Cause I was like, this is, I remember your project coming in because it was very different to what we would normally get, just the application in terms of the area. But did you have an original timeline? And then obviously COVID changed a lot of things. And did did that change a lot of kind of what the expectations were? And for Peter, I suppose, did that affect, you know, how long you thought, were you happy at carrying on with this? Because sometimes you might commit for X amount of time and you found it's like 2X or 3X. I mean, how did yes. that work for both of you? Well, I think we sort of um, had a vision. We might be about three months onto it and a year later we were still at it. So, <laughs> yeah. And uh, I, because the thing was fascinating and evolving, that was why you know there was a, there's, no, there's no there's no conclusion. It's just a it's a development of ideas. I no. I, I, th I think the key thing is that it, it helps you make decisions and bring dis get helps you and trustees make decisions. If you come to a table going, I don't know what, I'm, you know, I don't know, then that, that's quite difficult. Um, but if you go to a statistician, you work out and say, right, I don't know what I don't know. We'll start from there. And and then you can br start bringing um, what you've done and data to the table. And that starts discussions. I think the key thing is it opens up discussions. It helps you make better decisions. They still might not be the right decisions, but you're more likely to be doing the right, better decision making and also more fruitful conversations with your partners, your stakeholders and your trustees, if you can be really clear about um, the data. And these are simple things. It sounds really complicated, but it is actually ultimately much simpler in a way that, that than you think, because you can go to a partner, say, um, so one statistic always stands out uh, six percent of children in North Wales have ever been to a classical music concert. Well, you know, that's a statistic. But what are we can do about that, you know, if the trustees. So it, it's 
it's just helpful in moving things on and trying to get do better the next day, the next tomorrow. <laughs> Did, did any of those, like, out of curiosity, were those stuff that, like you just said, were a lot of those at odds to maybe what you and the other trustees thought? As in, did you get some stuff back from Peter? You're like, wow, we, I didn't think that. Or that's much bigger or much smaller than we originally thought it was. Or was it all kind of along the lines of what you broadly thought, but it was just having that data evidence to support it? Um, I, I think it's surprising to people. Um, and... It, I think it's just that there's so much information and data out there that anything that can start helping make sense of it in a way that enables us to take steps that start addressing and making an impact in the right area. Um, so that's a non-answer, but it's... Um, it's <laughs> it is an answer, don't worry. <laughs> okay. You can try the question again and I'll try and answer it better. <laughs> Because <laughs> I got I got lost in my answer. So what was your <laughs> question? <laughs> it was just whether any of the data, oh, like you know, any of the good things Peter said, like six percent of children had only yeah, been yeah. to a classical concert. Like you know, I don't know whether I'm surprised or not, but I didn't know whether you guys like we have it all the time in the applications I work in. You sometimes get a result. You're like, that's a bit different to what I maybe thought it would be, just anecdotally through you know what's out there. I think I think what it is is that as a small charity, you you so so you set yourself up because you're in an area of need, and North Wales has its economic challenges like many parts of the UK, and you don't necessarily know how to communicate that need because you you're quite often talking to funders and people who live outside the area, so you're literally in the trees, and you're trying to communicate to somebody who may have been to North Wales on holiday. But actually, and it looks lovely and, uh, you know, it's very busy, but actually don't know that, you know, Hollyhead has this number of homelessness and statistics like, and it helps bringing those statistics. And, and as a small charity, you, it's actually difficult even getting those, knowing where to look for those statistics. So it's, it's simpler in some ways. And it's just having somebody who's got the knowledge can look at the data, look at the statistics in a very critical way and, and be able to give you the confidence to take those statistics um, and surface them to your prospective funders and, and supporters. We still haven't got round to doing a final presentation to trustees. I don't know if we're ever going to do that now. So. Oh, I, oh uh, we'll make it happen, Peter. <laughs> well, I don't mind if we don't, because I, I can't remember what I was going to say anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, we've been, it's been going so well so far. <laughs> <laughs> right, can um, we get into half past? I, I just wanted to ask a um, uh, Peter and Perrin for if there's one piece of advice or take home message for uh, people here today um, so for charities and uh, volunteer statisticians what would that be? Well I, th I think the key thing is that if you're going to do this kind of stuff you've got to be sympathetic to what the people and and the work you're doing there's no point in tackling a subject which you're you're not really your heart's not in because you're giving your time and your effort, and so it's got to be something you believe in, I think. Otherwise, I wouldn't bother to do it. There's no point in just doing something for the sake of it, I think. From my side, it's um, if you're running a charity or in a charity, working for a charity, um, make sure you're setting up the groundwork um, in the organisation, however small or large you are. Even the smallest charity has a committee and trustees, and you'd be amazed, well, maybe not amazed, about... Um, the fear of numbers amongst some um, people um, and you have to have those conversations so that when you do working with a statistician it's not a surprise to everybody um, and so so make sure you've got having those conversations internally. Thank you. Um, without, um, I can't see any other hands um, in the chat um, yet, um, apart from a lot of thank you. Um, thank you very much for the speakers and the delegates to be part of the session today. Um, I think it is such an um, informative one. And I do hope uh, some of you 
who are thinking or would be interested in signing up uh, the Statistician Society initiative and for those uh, our fellow statisticians would be interested in joining um, as volunteer statistician in the scheme. So I think I'm going to close this session um, and thank you very much um, to everybody and I wish you have a lovely rest of your day and good weekend. Thank you and bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.